this thing on oh yes <laughs> new road mic i love it hey good morning mike bingham here I'd like to talk to you about the history of sales and uh consumer marketing versus industrial marketing and the sales territory let's go back uh, to colonial days when the first peddler was out there selling his wares and no i was not there so uh, refrain from the emails and text. I was not there. In the colonial days, the peddler or Yankee peddler or drummer would go fill his, his wagon up with all kinds of goods, household goods, pots, pans, musket, balls, powder, and he'd uh, go out to the hinterland. And a lot of times uh, he, he would sell all his wares to include his horse and his wagon and all goods except for a brace of pistols because he was carrying cash and wanted to get back to Boston so he could redo this process. And there were highwaymen out there. Hence the Second Amendment. That's another matter. Uh, to that end, uh, in order to notify the countryside he was coming, he would literally beat a drum. Hence the term drummer. And since drumming sounds are not natural, we didn't have noise pollution back then. Anything that was not natural was immediately perked ears up. And, uh, well, here comes uh, Yankee peddler Joe with his wares. Let's go in and see what he's got. So that's how that term drummer came about. One unique thing, uh, he would not be able to carry all goods people wanted. So Farmer Jack said, uh, I need a new plow or I need an axe. And he'd take that, write it down in his black book, and says, Farmer Jack, one plow, one axe. That was a booking. And the booking then translated into an order when he actually secured that product. And when he took it back and actually sold it, that became a sale. So you have bookings, orders, shipments that eventually become sales when they're paid for, except when working with the U.S. government, which is going to take another 90 days, but that's another discussion and another topic. So that's how that whole rigmarole got started. One thing I'd like to pass on, because I know it's of importance in your minds, why do the colonials paint their houses blue? Why was that the most popular colonial color back in the olden days and I was not alive? The reason for that was it was thought that flies would be least attracted to the color blue. A study was made, <laughs> I think it was a government grant in the Obama administration, but about uh, why flies are attracted to colors. And it, it really <laughs> became apparent that flies are attracted to the color blue because of their ocular structure and are attracted to ultraviolet spectrum of light. So the, they had it wrong on that. Now, the reason flies did not stick around in colonial days was because the paint was manufactured with a very high density concentration of lye. And lye is, is an insecticide, which is probably the best in both worlds. Nobody knew about it at that time because they didn't test for that. But flies were attracted to color blue. They went up there. They got poisoned. They flew away from it saying, I'm getting sick. I'm getting out of here. But the pioneers saw that and said, well, blue must be the way to go, and which it was until they came up with synthetic paints. And that's another story, DDT, whole new spectrum. So we covered that portion of it. Let's now turn to consumer versus industrial marketing. And my notes are over here. That's why I constantly turn this way. Consumer marketing. We're all consumers. We all buy things. And consumer marketing is lower priced products, even though automobiles at $40,000 a pop fall into that consumer market. It's a, it's a pull strategy where you go to the pop machine, you put a dollar, if you're in holiday ends, it's a dollar fifty, uh, and you pull a lever and you get your can of pop, candy bar, whatever it might be. It's a pull strategy. It's a one point of sale origin. Consumer marketing is different in from uh, industrial marketing in that, one, the product is vastly more expensive. It's typically capital equipment, which takes a capital, capital expenditure request. 
it's a technical sale because there's a lot of nuances about it. It's not, not a candy bar. It's not even a washing machine with all the timers and Bluetooth stuff like that. It's a push strategy where you have to have a very highly trained technical sales force push the product onto the customer base. And the customer base also is a lot smaller. It's a pyramid effect. You got high dollars up here, very few customers. You got low dollars down at the bottom, you got many customers. And we are at the top of the pyramid on that aspect of it. A technical sale, industrial sale, requires many meetings at the plant, many meetings with different disciplines. You've got engineering involved, manufacturing involved, probably QC department involved. You might even have the controller involved. And you might have the maintenance guy if there's uh, sophisticated installation requirements like concrete foundations, electrical, air conditioning, this kind of thing involved. So uh, it's not an easy process. It's a long drawn out process. The rewards, however, are a lot better than when you're selling an automobile and uh, get a meager commission on that aspect of it. Okay, let's bring us to the next aspect of it. And that's what you're going to find in industry when it comes to the sales department and respect in corporate boardrooms. I was a product manager and participated in numerous board meetings, and here's how it typically went. The engineering guy put in his uh, request for funds, and nobody questioned it. They might about the dollars, but he, he, a five-minute speech on his part, he was justified. Same thing with the manufacturing director or VP of manufacturing. Well, we need this new grinder because it's going to out, out to put our other capacity and we're going to improve the quality of the product. It's going to have a 10% more throughput. Okay, done deal. Even to some extent, the marketing department could get away with a budget because, oh, we got to advertise. The advertising dollar's gone up, so we got to advertise more to get some business in here. It comes to the poor sales guy, sales manager, sales director, VP of sales, whatever you want to call it. That's where he is the most disrespected guy there. It's real easy for a, <laughs> a manufacturing VP to take credit when he makes his numbers. Well, you know, we were supposed to ship uh, 300 widgets. We, we shipped 301 widgets. Yeah, that's great. Well, you already got the order in-house. You know what your cost is going to be. You know how many people you have to put on. It doesn't take Einstein to know you're probably going to beat the numbers. Here comes a poor sales guy <laughs> with everything in the world against him. And the main thing is the attitude in the boardroom. So, so why haven't you made your numbers? <laughs> they don't want to hear excuses. They basically want to hear, why, why don't you meet your numbers? When are you going to meet your numbers? And that kind of thing. Excuse me, my nose is stuffed up with this uh, wet weather we're having and all. I was told by a, a director of finance that happened to be the controller that... <laughs> I know about sales. I buy things. So uh, we don't really need a sales manager. We don't even need a sales force because people will buy our products. It's that good. Forward thinking, progressive thinking like that, I must say I was shocked and amazed that this person uh, rose to such a level, but she did in any event. You don't get any respect in sales till you make your numbers, and if you do, you're only as good as your last sales. That's things to remember, young sales guys. You're only good as your last sales. You can have all the awards and plaques on the walls you want from the past years. Not going to do you a damn bit of good if you ain't making your numbers, and you damn sure better make your numbers. Nothing happens in industry until a sales guy makes his numbers, and that's the key th critical thing to remember from this takeaway. So we cover the boardroom attitudes and this kind of thing. Let's take us to the marketing department that I mentioned. They do get a modicum of respect, and uh, usually they're pretty uh, accepted in what they state. Their main function is to create profitable sales for your product through making the customer aware of the need for the product. Key takeaways. Profitable sales. Profit is not a dirty word in industry. It's a highly needed word. You need margin. You need sales. You need profitable sales. You don't need discount sales. If you're discounting and getting your business going that way, you're not a salesperson. 
So quit watching this video and go do something else. Profitable sales by making the customer aware of the need for your product. And that's what is all about on marketing. It's all about generating the sales lead because until the sales guy gets the lead, in reality, you're not going to get any new business. You might get repeat business, reoccurring business from current customers, which is a death knell because if everybody's growth chart's going like that and you're only selling your current customer, you're going like that. When you tilt it up <laughs> for new business, you're actually losing bus new business. Got to find new business. We'll go into this later on on cold calling and that aspect of it. But to seriously think you're going to go out on knock on doors, make cold calls at $400 a sales call, that's not facing reality in that aspect. That's the whole purpose of the marketing department is to create leads so that the sales guy can take it over from there. Which brings us to our last topic. We'll go into all of these in a lot more detail in future. But uh, the sales territory itself, which is an amazing uh, <laughs> subject as it would be. I've worked for a lot of companies, uh, Japan-based, Germany-based, England-based, that uh, set up an office in the U.S., decide to make a sales force, recruit people, or they might keep in place their current uh, sales force. <laughs> But they always come in and say, well, let's talk, look at the territory we've got here and how do you have the, the thing divided up? And they look at a map and say, well, it's all jagged and it doesn't make any rhyme or reason on why this happens. You have to stop and, and educate these folks and say, look, this didn't develop in a vacuum. There's different ways that customers are covered in certain geographical areas and locations. Anybody that's sold in Pennsylvania knows you don't put your sales office in Philadelphia and effectively, I said effectively, expect to cover Erie, Pennsylvania, which is on the complete other side of the state. Erie, Pennsylvania has always been covered by Cleveland. The same with Gary, Indiana. If you're in Indianapolis, you're not going to run up three, four hours up to Gary when you got a problem. That's covered out of the Chicago office. This was all documented in this book, The Nine Nations of North America. It was written in the 80s. I was attending an uh, Excel spreadsheet forecasting class, and the, guy, the author of that class turned me on to this book by Joel Gorrell. And how he did this was basically... Uh, he was an editor of the, of the Washington Post, and he had his uh, journalist out covering the country. He was, was seeking a way to develop a, a way to know news patterns so it could be on top of a story before it broke. <clears throat> and what he found out through his research and everything was there was actually nine nations in North America. Uh, there are probably more than that since, since now. But there's different geographical areas in the U.S. covered with different methodologies on how people buy things. Let me give you a known example. At one time, I worked for a laser company out of Connecticut. Nice people, family owned, very, very good people. I had to go to Mississippi to try to sell a laser. Now, first of all, being from Ohio, thank God I was in the military and have somewhat of a southern drawl in my accent. So I was more or less tolerated, but when we got down to, to brass tacks, there's no way in hell anybody in Mississippi is going to buy a damn thing from anybody in, in uh, Connecticut unless they absolutely have to, and there are just other alternatives. If you don't have a sales office in Georgia, you ain't going to sell diddly in Mississippi. And Bubba, you ain't got a, an office in Alabama? Hey, we ain't buying from you. you a damn Yankee, and they do remember the war, so... That's one thing. If you're selling farm equipment manufactured in Iowa and expect to sell it to farmers in Oregon, you better have somebody on the ground that speaks a local language. And if you go through this book, it's a fascinating read. They've got the uh, U.S. markets divided up into basically nine territories. They've got Quebec, eh, for these French speakers, New England, 
the foundry, which Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin and the like are in there. Dixie. They got Mex America, which encompasses uh, L.A., uh, of course, Oklahoma, Texas, that kind of thing. They've got the uh, empty quarter, which is Montana, Minnesota, all that stuff. They've got Ecotopia, guess what? That's uh, Northern California, Oregon, Washington, dude. And uh, basically, that's how they've uh, broke down the nine nations of North America. Good read. Get it if you want. I'd recommend it for any sales manager that uh, is worth his weight on that aspect of it. Uh, let's see what else we're going to talk about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nine Nations of North America sales territory. The question is, talking about sales territory. Damn. Does the salesman make the territory or does the territory make the salesman? And that's, that's what you, when you're evaluating sales guys and their performance, you have to look at that. Unfortunately, the model has been uh, by American corporations and the, the thought process is, well, uh, Steve's been doing a great job. I mean, he's got Boeing wrapped around his finger and he's broke quota, you know, for the second straight year. Let's make Steve a... Uh, national sales manager so he can show other people how to do this thing you got to realize is steve has never sold a damn thing to anybody in michigan let alone florida texas alabama or new england he's good at what he does but he's a one-hit wonder who gets a job steve gets a job and that's why sales fluctuate up and down so much so that's one of the things to be aware of uh on the risk of that aspect uh getting promoted to your main point of impotence and uh, inefficiency with that you know we're going to cut this a little bit short today i've been going on for about uh, 20 minutes now i'd like to introduce you guys to the my office staff and these guys will be paramount to the uh, futures channels here Introducing you to Jake and Elwood. Jake, the tall one, is my collections guy. So you PayPal people that don't shape up, you can expect a midnight visit from Jake. Elwood over here is my office manager. And he's in charge of telling me when I've got texts coming in, emails coming in, and PayPal's coming in. And his main function in life, his main goal is to develop an app that will put HR out of business. So that's Elwood's main purpose and function. So with that said, I'm out of here going. <laughs>